want to welcome everybody today to our uh, Groundhog edition of virtual uh, Ground Rounds here at Mary Greeley. Uh, today, I'm pleased to uh, welcome uh, Dr. Brendan Lamper as our guest speaker. Uh, Dr. Lamper completed his medical school training at the University of Virginia, and he has done uh, multiple postgraduate uh, uh, training programs, residencies in pediatrics and adolescent medicine, uh, clinical genetics, and a uh, fellowship in biochemical uh, genetics at Baylor University. So uh, he's well trained and versed in uh, the topic of today, which is clinical genomics. And uh, this has been a, a topic that we've had requested many, many times. And I think we uh, finally got a speaker who is going to address many of the things that have been asked about in the past. So um, I'm very excited to have Dr. Lamper here, and I will uh, turn the uh, virtual podium over to him. Uh, thanks very much. Um, hopefully everybody can see my slides now. Um, so like you said, I'm uh, Brendan Lamper. I'm um, just up north of you guys at Mayo. Um, I'm a clinical geneticist, and so my goal today is really talk about what's exciting in genetics. I think our field is changing dramatically um, right now. Um, and there's a lot to be excited about, and I think what we do in my field is going to be applicable to far more patients and far more uh, of our colleagues in other specialties, um, both now and, and even more so in the future. So I'm going to talk a bit about the kinds of patients I see and that other people in my department see. Um, I'm going to talk a decent amount, a bit about genetic testing because that's a huge topic and there's lots of different tests and different kinds of tests and pros and cons of different kinds of testing. Um, and kind of the thought process I use when I choose tests and, and, and how I interpret results. And then some exciting uh, progress in treating genetic disease. Um, for a long time, I think our field has been a diagnostic one and more and more it's pivoting to more management. Because um, we have some really exciting targeted therapies for genetic disease um, right now and even more coming in the future. So I'll introduce some of those. So why do people come see me uh, or other geneticists and, and why is genetic testing helpful? Um, the first is to accurately diagnose people. We see lots of folks that are on a diagnostic odyssey, patients who have been dealing with complex or unusual symptoms for, for years often. Um, and don't have a name or a reason for their, their uh, challenges. And so if we can name it, if we can diagnose it, that's, there's real uh, benefit just in that. But it can also give a more accurate prognosis for people. We can uh, accurately describe recurrence risk. And if we know the genetic cause in a proband, in the first person in the family, we can help their parents or their siblings or even them in, in their um, family planning decisions with prenatal testing or even pre-implantation testing with our IVF colleagues. And then, of course, managing genetic disease. You know, for a long time, it's just been, you know, if a child has Down syndrome, we know kind of what to watch for when, and, and we make sure that all the right uh, monitoring and surveillance things are being um, watched for. We've, of course, been able to treat a lot of metabolic disorders for a long time. One of the things that appealed to me and one of the reasons I've focused on inborn errors and metabolism for much of my career is that we could treat them. I see lots of folks with PKU and our dietitian and I work closely together to help help them stay kind of in, uh, as healthy as possible. And then again, now we've got these gene targeted therapies that we'll talk about. Who do we see? I, I tend to, when I'm trying to sell genetics to trainees or medical students or residents and other specialties, I say, we see everybody's most interesting patients. Um, and I think that's true. Uh, we see patients with issues, you know, and essentially all different systems, all different kinds of problems tend to be the more complicated and challenging to identify uh, a cause or most more challenging to identify the right treatment um, is what sort of brings them to us. My particular focus in our department is on pediatrics. And so I see lots of kids with developmental disorders, a lot of children with autism or intellectual disability. Um, seizures, uh, muscular dystrophies, myopathies. Uh, of course, kids with congenital anomalies, whether it's structural heart disease or cleft palate or what have you. Um, my particular interest is also in liver disease, and so I see lots of kids with liver dysfunction, hyperaminemia, that kind of thing. But really, 
we can we see patients with all different kinds of problems um, uh, in our group. Other people in our department focus more on adult medicine, um, and so they might see patients with neuropathy or the early onset dementias, again with epilepsy and movement disorders. We have a big um, interest in aortopathy, so folks with dilated aorta or aneurysms looking for connective tissue diseases. Um, we see a lot of folks with cardiomyopathy. I'm not really going to talk about cancer genetics today. We have about half of the patients that come see our department have breast or, or colorectal cancer or something like that. Um, that's a whole talk in and of itself uh, that's super important, but not what I'm going to focus on. We see lots of people with familial uh, chronic kidney disease. Um, I see a lot of adults with PKU and other metabolic disorders. So again, it's interesting patients from all across uh, other specialties. And um, that's one of the things I really love about this. It feels like you're both a generalist and a specialist. We see really fascinating diseases from all parts of the body at all different age uh, points. Now, how have things changed recently? The, I think what I always tell families is the only thing that's good that's come out of COVID is that we can now do a lot of telemedicine. And many of the labs that we work with have developed these home kits where you can just send them a buckle swab, they can collect a, a cheek swab sample or a saliva sample from home, mail it in, and we get very accurate genetic testing from that. Um, telemedicine actually works really well for like a dysmorphology exam. A lot of the kids I see with autism interact better with an iPad than they do with me. So um, it actually works quite well and we, at least as long as the public health emergency continues, uh, we should be able to continue doing that. And so right now about 40 to 50 percent of our visits any given uh, week are telemedicine. Now, what are the tests we use? There's lots of different kinds of genetic tests and it really depends on what you're looking for. Um, any given week, I probably order multiple um, tests from this list um, and, and sort of keeping up with how they're changing and what they can and won't detect is, is a big part of what we do. When we think about choosing the right test, thinking about what you're looking for is the most important thing. And as a reminder, there's a lot of different kinds of genetic changes that can lead to disease. You can have a chromosome abnormality, you can have a copy number variant where there's tens of thousands of bases missing or extra. You can have single gene deletions, you can have rearrangements within genes, you can have single base pair changes, you can have triplet repeat expansions. Lots of different kinds of genetic changes, and there's no one chemistry, unfortunately, that is optimized to detect all of them. And so having kind of a menu of different tests is helpful. The one I think we all learned about first in medical school is probably karyotype, which is really where you look at, at, um, at chromosomes under a microscope. And this is still the very best test looking for aneuploidies. So if you're looking for trisomy 21, trisomy 13 or 18, Kleinfeld or Turner syndrome. It's also the best test looking for balanced uh, rearrangements, translocation between chromosomes where there's not actually missing or extra genetic material. Um, and so we still use it often for those indications, but it's not a screening test in the way it used to be when it was the best test we had. FISH testing or fluorescent in situ hybridization is faster than a karyotype. One of the downsides of a karyotype is that it requires dividing cells in culture. So it's going to take two weeks, kind of no matter how fast you want it to be, uh, for those cells to be um, uh, ready for staining. Um, so this is a little bit faster. So if you have a child in the neonatal intensive care unit or something that you're worried about, trisomy 18 or, or 13, it's a great test to get an answer faster. Um, really depends on knowing what you're looking for. A fish test will look for one location, not lots. You can do multiple fish tests at once, but really we do it when we have something very specific we're looking for um, and we want to diagnose or rule out a particular thing. In many ways, fish has been trans um, has been passed over by uh, chromosome microarrays. Chromosome microarrays came out early in my uh, training in the mid 2000s, um, and it was a really exciting change. Basically, the way it works is you take patient DNA and control DNA, stain them diff differently, and, and uh, compare how they hybridize to um, control probes. 
And if you have more than expected patient DNA, you'll see that color. If you have less than expected patient DNA, you'll see the color that you um, that the normal DNA is stained with, or the control DNA. And so it's a very good way of, of looking across the genome for deletions and duplications. This can detect much smaller variations than a karyotype. Karyotype, the smallest change you can see uh, in even the very best um, hands is around 5 million to 10 million uh, base pairs or letters of DNA. With microarray, depending on the platform, depending on the specific array, um, some are designed to detect down to 10 to 20 uh, thousand base pair uh, rearrangements. Detects aneuploidy well. It does not detect and will miss uh, balanced rearrangements because, again, there's nothing missing or extra. It's just in the wrong order, which this can't, um, can't resolve. Um, some of the challenges with this is when you start looking at smaller and smaller abnormalities, you find much more variations of uncertain significance. That'll be a theme we come back to when we get into the sequencing tests. Um, again, the it really depends on what you're looking for. There's a number of phenotypes that are caused by deletions or duplications. And so if someone looks like they got DeGeorge syndrome or prader willi syndrome or Cree du Chat syndrome or something, then a microarray is typically the first test we'll do. When we think about sequencing, sometimes we do sequencing for a single gene, which is useful if you've got a very particular phenotype that you're looking for. Sometimes we'll do testing with a panel, and you can get a panel that's got two genes on it, you can get a panel that's got 500 genes on it. Um, but fundamentally, these are looking at particular phenotypes that drive a generation of a gene list, and then sequencing those changes. Some panels, depending on what lab you're sending it to, will also detect deletions or duplications within a gene. Some will not. And so being aware of kind of what the limits of detection are for whatever your lab partner is, uh, is a really important uh, part of this. Um, one thing to sort of mention when we think about sequencing is um, I see a lot of patients where mitochondrial disease is suspected. And so the mitochondrial genome is different than the nuclear genome. Uh, there's 37 genes in the mitochondrial genome. It's in the vast majority of cases entirely maternally inherited. But there's lots of mitochondria in each cell, and you can have mutations in some of them, but not all of them. And so sometimes we have to deal with heteroplasmy, where there's an abnormality detected in some percentage of mitochondrial genomes, but not all of them. Um, and for many mitochondrial uh, DNA abnormalities, there's a threshold effect where you might see a disease if someone has 80 or 90 percent uh, abnormal mitochondrial genomes, but not if they're 50% or 30%. And so you can see a lot of variation within a family and, and help makes familial testing a little bit more complicated. The other challenge with heteroplasmy is that it can be highly variable from tissue to tissue. So you might see low level heteroplasmy in a blood test, but very high level if you do a muscle biopsy or a liver biopsy or, or, or whatever sample you're looking at. So it's, it, there's a good bit of complexity with mitochondrial uh, testing. Just as a reminder, mitochondrial diseases can present with all different kinds of symptoms, again, depending on the tissue involvement and the heteroplasmy levels within those tissues. Uh, I think about it when I see people with strokes or stroke-like episodes or seizures, certainly with developmental regression, and then thinking about the high-energy de dependent uh, tissue, so cardiomyopathy, uh, retinal disease, um, uh, pancreatic dysfunction are all things that are commonly seen with mitochondrial disorders. Let's talk about some uh, about more comprehensive genetic testing, whole exome or whole genome sequencing. The Human Genome Project was completed in 2003, which was right when I was in the middle of my residencies. Uh, it seemed really exciting. They sequenced one person's DNA. It took a team of thousands of scientists, 13 years, and about $5 billion to do it. Um, and they got a good bit of it wrong. But it, you know, that wasn't that long ago. And so what's changed in kind of my field is that now we can do this routinely. It's incredible how much uh, the chemistry involved in genetic testing has changed. It's not really a chemistry challenge anymore as much as it is a data management challenge. Um, we can generate genetic data far more easily than we can interpret it in a lot of cases. 
Um, so whole exome sequencing has been around clinically since uh, about 2010 or so. And with this, we are sequencing nearly all of the exons in the genome. There's a few genes that have challenging chemistry because of pseudogenes or because of other kinds of local abnormalities or local uh, unusual uh, issues. Um, but typical whole exome sequencing now, we're detecting and getting good results from uh, over 99% of the genes um, that we currently know of. And this is very good at detecting single nucleotide variants or copy number variants in exons. Right now, about 85% of known disease-causing mutations happen in exons. Right now is the key phrase there. We haven't had the ability to test non-exonic variants for long. And just as a reminder, exons account for about 1.5% of all of our DNA. That's probably the most important part. That's the coding part. That's the part that, that, that leads to proteins. Um, and a lot of the other area is quite repetitive, and we think it's tolerant of variation, but there's just so much we don't know still uh, about what variations mean in the non-coding portions of our genome. So more recently, we've been doing whole genome sequencing. This has been clinically available for about a year been done on a research basis for four or five years, probably. Um, and it's got some uh, benefits over whole exome sequencing. It is a PCR-free approach. You don't have to isolate just the exons. We just sequence everything. So it's actually, from a chemistry standpoint, a bit simpler and faster, uh, at least to generate the data, than whole exome sequencing is. Um, we do detect variations across the genome. We may not know what they mean, but we detect them. And so that allows for us to reanalyze the data over time and to learn more. Uh, as we learn more, we can look back at the data generated today uh, and may find the answers that we don't recognize as we see it now. The challenge is, of course, more variations. Now, what does variations mean? The, the challenge and, and what's sort of fascinating and beautiful about genetics is that we're all different, right? Um, I'm very glad we're all different, but it makes it hard sometimes to know what, what we're finding. Um, average, uh, typical person has about almost 3 billion um, base pairs in their DNA and almost 5 million differences from the reference sequence. Of those, about 150,000 or so per person are rare enough to be interesting or concerning and about 150 of which pass all the sort of automatic filters to say if this one could be disease causing. And so usually the interpretive work, there's, you know, depending on the phenotype you're dealing with, um, you know, a handful to dozens of genes that really need deep interpretation um, by, a, um, by a, a lab professional, either a geneticist or a lab director. And so there's a lot of work that goes into this, much more so than just the chemistry. The interpretation is really important. The most important thing to get that part right is an accurate phenotype. We know what the patient has. If we know what their, their issues are, we can have a better sense of, well, this change could cause those issues or it really has nothing to do with it. If all we know is a person has epilepsy, it's much more uh, it's much less helpful than if we know the kind of epilepsy, the severity is what's the MRI look like, you know, other health problems, uh, things like that. So identifying a, a very complete and detailed phenotype um, really helps the lab folks and the genetics folks to um, interpret the variants that we find accurately. We put a lot of time and effort into counseling patients and families before we do the testing. The um, this is different, I think, than a lot of diagnostic tests we do because we can find stuff we're not looking for. Um, one of the things we spend a lot of time thinking about is secondary incidental findings. We'll talk a little about, about the American College of Medical Genetics 73, which is which are genes that are important enough that we just report regardless of what the uh, indication for testing is. We often find variations of uncertain significance, and we don't solve every case. Not even close, really. We're better now than we've ever been before, but there's still a lot of learning that has to happen before we can solve even a majority of the patients we see. 
these are expensive tests. More and more, we're getting good insurance coverage, but it's still a, often a journey to try to figure out, is it going to be covered? What's out of pocket going to be? And those kinds of things. We can find unexpected things about a family. We typically will do exome or genome sequencing with parent samples when available to see if a variant is de novo or inherited or if we see two variations in one gene. You can't tell from looking just at the probands data, are there two in one copy and none on the other, or are they biallelic, meaning both copies of the gene are abnormal. And comparing parents is really helpful in that. When we do that, we can find consanguinity where parents are related. It's also the single most expensive paternity test in the world, which we deal with with some regularity. And then we spend a little bit of time talking about the GINA Act or the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act, which protects against health uh, coverage um, denials or limitations based on a genetic test, protects against an employment discrimination, doesn't currently apply to uh, long-term care insurance, uh, life insurance, disability insurance, um, and it's a law, that, so of course it could be changed or weakened in the future, hopefully not, but um, it's been on the books since 2008 uh, right now. The uh, ACMG 73, so again, this is the American College of Medical Genetics. Um, they identified, it started out as 59, it's now up to 73 uh, genes that are actionable enough where early identification can really change outcomes uh, that regardless of what the um, indication for testing is, patients should be uh, offered these results. So examples would be like the breast cancer risk genes, the Lynch syndrome or, or colorectal cancer risk genes, Marfan syndrome, things like that. There's a decent amount of controversy in the genetics world about what should we include on this list and which aren't, and how actionable does it have to be to be included on this? Are we limiting autonomy for pediatric patients who um, we're doing this kind of testing on? What do you do with variations of uncertain significance in those genes? And what do you do with if someone's a carrier for a recessive condition in one of these genes? Um, and there's no clear answers for this. And so each lab will approach these things a little bit differently. Um, and so again, knowing the, your lab partners and, and kind of having a plan and talking about these things in advance with patients, I think is really helpful. The limitations of genetic testing are you know, of course, variable penetrance. So the same gene variant won't express itself itself the same way in every patient. And so even if we know a genetic disease is present, it doesn't mean it's a crystal ball. We can't tell patients exactly what to expect uh, in the vast majority of cases. Still finding a lot of variations on certain significance. And sometimes we raise concerns without really having any answers. And that can be challenging. There's always a chance for error, like any testing uh, procedure, and at least historically, finding a genetic cause didn't really change treatment. I think that's changing now, at least it's starting to, um, and so that's an exciting kind of area of progress. People often ask, what are the chances of finding an answer, and it really depends on what we're seeing the patient for. Um, there's a overall, all the patients we see in, in our clinic here, we find a answer for the, the phenotype we're seeing about a third of the time. Um, some indications are much more likely to be solved than others. If it, we see a child who uh, has uh, lack, isn't hearing or fails in newborn screening or has early vision loss or multiple congenital anomalies, we're pretty good finding the genetic cause for those. If we so see someone with autoimmunity or autism or um, diabetes, I'm sure there are genetic factors in those things. We have a pretty low yield for testing right now. I think we're pretty decent at finding if there's one genetic cause for all of someone's issues. There's a monogenic disease, a Mendelian disease. I think I'm hopeful that we're pretty good at finding those. We don't yet have the tools to find out, well, what if there's 10 different variations that are all together leading to a phenotype? I'm sure that's a thing that happens biologically. These genes work together in networks and signaling pathways. But that's a level of kind of data science that we just haven't gotten to yet. So stay tuned. I think answers will come. Uh, I'm going to talk now about one of my favorite patients that sort of demonstrated some of the interesting challenges with genetic testing. Um, it's a family I've been following for a number of years now. Uh, I met this girl first when she was two and a half. 
And she had really severe to profound developmental delay. She had many, many seizures every day, um, non-verbal, non-ambulatory. She had really made very, very little developmental progress. Um, she was not dysmorphic. She had had normal newborn screening. You know, she was generally pretty medically healthy from a sort of hospitalization and an acute crisis standpoint, but just seizing and not making progress uh, was her main phenotype. So the first test I did was a chromosome microarray. And this revealed that she had a duplication of 22Q11.2, kind of interesting, and excess homozygosity. And so we knew her parents were first cousins, they were consanguineous, and so the excess homozygosity wasn't a huge surprise. 22Q11, this is the same region that is du deleted in DeGeorge syndrome or velocardiofacial syndrome. Uh, it's duplicated in her. Uh, the same mechanism at a molecular level that leads to a deletion can lead to a duplication. And so we see these in about equal amounts um, in terms of frequency. The duplication syndrome is typically pretty mild. These kids are at higher risk for some mild learning disabilities. They're typically a little smaller than their peers. They may have some hypotonia. Often we find it in healthy parents. Hers was de novo, which was interesting. Um, and so is this the answer? So Occam's razor is, of course, tempting. You know, if you find an answer, you've got an answer. Don't look for something more. But you know, uh, I think it's important to go back to the patient. Uh, her phenotype didn't fit. She was much more delayed than we expect with 22Q du duplication. And the seizures and the intractable nature of her seizures was just not what you would expect. And so we ended up doing whole exome sequencing and found that she had homozygous uh, null mutation in this gene called AP4B1, uh, which at the time was just being described as a newly newly discovered uh, recessive uh, disease that fits her phenotype very well. And so a reminder, it's not always Occam's razor. There's always Hickam's dictum, which is patients have as many diseases as they want. And uh, so I have had many patients that have more than one rare genetic diagnosis, and it's just um, always interesting. So what happened with her? Uh, she is now enrolled in a multi-center study, uh, trying to study these patients. and. Uh, in a natural history study for them. Um, because we were, didn't just stop at the 22 key duplication, we ended up doing pre-implantation genetic testing with their family through IVF, and they had a healthy son about two years ago now. Um, and so you know, we don't have a solution for her disease, but at least we're able to provide accurate recurrence risk uh, counseling for them. Moving on from sort of testing issues, I'd like to talk about treatment now. Um, treating the genetic disease, like I said in the beginning, was for a long time limited really to the inborn areas of metabolism. I follow a ton of patients with PKU or phenylketonuria, really fun disease to take care of, uh, at least to me. Um, and mostly it's a dietary treatment. There are some newer medications that have been quite uh, beneficial to some patients. But for most of my career, it's just been modifying their diet, watching levels, adjusting diet, watching levels, adjusting diet. Um, early in my career, the first uh, enzyme replacement therapy was approved for Gaucher disease. Um, and since then, we've got many other enzyme replacement therapies for other lysosomal storage diseases, Pompeii disease, Fabre disease, most of the mucopolysaccharidoses. Um, and, and others, we now have uh, ERT for, and it works better for some diseases than for others. There are some limitations. It does not cross the blood-brain barrier. So for the neurodegenerative disorders, it's not as good. But for the more somatic diseases like Gaucher, at least type 1 Gaucher or Pompeii disease, it's a very nice treatment. We've, of course, done organ transplants for some diseases you know, stem cell transplant for Hurler syndrome or for X-linked adrenal leukodystrophy or metachromatic leukodystrophy, uh, liver transplant for the urea cycle defects or maple syrup urine disease or, or what have you. But for many diseases, we haven't had a really targeted therapy and we've had symptomatic management, which is rewarding in its own way, but it's never been as, um, we're not addressing the problem, the root of the problem. Now, uh, two types of therapy I want to talk about, not the only things out there, but one is antisense oligonucleotide therapies, and the other is gene therapy. Both of these are kind of really exciting 
areas of growth. So the first disease to talk about here is Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Uh, I'm sure this is familiar to everyone. We all learned about it in medical school. It's the most common muscular dystrophy. It's an X-linked disease, so it affects boys much more severely than girls in most cases. Um, and it is uh, sort of a classic muscular dystrophy where kids will often present with delayed motor skills, waddle and gait, the Gower sign, of course, and it's rapidly progressive. Untreated boys with classic Duchenne muscular dystrophy will typically be uh, wheelchair dependent by the time they're in middle school, um, will develop cardiomyopathy as adolescents, and typically uh, have cardiac or respiratory failure in late adolescence or early adulthood. It's really a devastating, uh, terrible disease. It's fascinating from a genetic standpoint. The gene involved, dystrophin or DMD, is the longest known human gene. It's got 79 exons, which is huge. Uh, there are thousands of different mutations that can lead to uh, disease, about a third of which are sequence variants and about two thirds of which are copy number variants, so deletions or duplications within this large gene. Basically, any mutation that leads to no protein being produced will lead to Duchenne muscular dystrophy. If some protein is produced and it's either not enough or not normal, but still is present, the phenotype is different. It's Becker muscular dystrophy, which is a much milder condition. And typically, people have some weakness issues later in life, but um, not nearly as many problems as with Duchenne. So one of the common types of mutations that lead to this are deletions of X, a single exon or a group of exons. And this really causes problems when it affects frame. So remember that DNA is read in a series of codons and um, you know, three nucleotides leads to one amino acid uh, in the uh, translation process. And so if, an, if there's a frame shift between exons, uh, then losing one of those can really throw off the frame for the entire protein downstream of that spot. And so a common location for there to be problems in this gene uh, accounts for about 13% of all people with Duchenne muscular dystrophy is a deletion of exons 49 to 50. And this is important because at exon 50 to 51, there's this frame shift. And if exon 50 and 51 are both present, they match up together correctly. But you try to link exon 51 to 48 or 49, it's not going to work. And so if you have that frame shift, you'll find this uh, early stop codon that leads to no dystrophy being, being produced. So there's this new drug that's called teplicin, which is an um, antisense oligonucleotide. It's not exactly RNA. They've done some substitutions within it to make it both shelf-stable and uh, less targetable by the immune system. Um, and what this does is it binds to exon 51, which is present in these patients with the deletion of exons 49 and 50, and it basically knocks that out of the mRNA. And so it allows normal frame um, to be restored between exons 48 and 52. And so a healthy, normal person will have all of these exons present patients with deletions of exons 49 to 50 uh, will have no dystrophin produced because of this, out, of this early stop codon that is introduced by the outer frame mutation. We restore that reading frame. We've got everything upstream of the deletion is present in the protein. Everything downstream is present. They, they produce a dystrophin that is functional. It's not normal, but it's functional. And so does this work? It really does. Um, this is from the time of diagnosis. This is a measure of six meter walk time um, or six minute walk uh, test. So how far a kid can walk in six uh, minutes. So usually kids at the time of diagnosis can actually get around okay. And untreated patients with these deletions are non-ambulatory within a couple of years. With treatment, they have some decline, but it's much, much slower and their long-term functional outlook is much better. So it really is effective. Uh, you can see this on staining too. Uh, this shows kind of without treatment, you don't see any dystrophin in these patients. You do a muscle biopsy a couple months later, 
and this is staining for dystrophin, and this looks the way it should. You know, these like rings of, of dystrophin lighting up around the edges of muscle fibers is what you should see. Like any rare disease, one of the challenges is paying for treatments. Uh, this is hugely expensive. It's about $30,000 or $300,000 per year uh, currently. Next, I want to talk about spinal muscular atrophy. Um, when I started in my career, this was the most common recessive killer of children. Um, it's a common disease. About one in 50 of us is a carrier for this condition. Uh, and historically, it's just terrible. It leads to a rapid loss of motor skills, usually with respiratory failure at one or two years of age, and there was no effective treatments uh, for it. Uh, it's also interesting from a genetic standpoint. Uh, it's mostly caused by deletions within this gene SMN1. But what's cool about this is there's a there's a um, pseudogene or a paralog paral paralogous gene right next door um, that's called SMN2, which is identical to SMN1, except there's this 11 base pair difference that introduces a abnormal splice site to SMN2 that makes it non-functional. So just to sort of show a picture of this, you got these two genes right next to one another. SMN1, in the normal case, it's just 8 exons, so it's a much smaller gene than Duchenne uh, dystrophin is. Um, in SMN2, you've got this abnormal sequence just outside of exon 7 that leads to an abnormal splice site there. And so exon 7 is not incorporated into mRNA. This is non-functional. We've got this new drug that binds to that splice site, silences it, restores that exon 7 to the mRNA from SMN2. And now this is a functional gene. In most of us, it's not. We're not using that gene at all. We don't need it because SMN1 is doing its thing. But with this treatment, we can restore normal function of SMN2. This drug is challenging to deliver. It's an intrathecal injection, uh, essentially quarterly or so. Decent amount of side effects. It's about $125,000 per dose, but it really works. So event-free survival uh, in the treated group and control group, you can see is very, very different. Overall survival is, is very different. The challenge is this needs to be done before patients are significantly symptomatic. Um, and so the development of this medication really drove the inclusion of spinal muscular atrophy on newborn screening. And it's now on the newborn screening for nearly every state and increasingly in other countries as well. There's also now FDA approved antisense oligonucleotide therapies for TTR amyloidosis and some of the acute porphyrias as well as many others in development uh, for some relatively common diseases. One of the exciting things about this for me, though, is that it doesn't have to be common disease. This uh, is a short version of a story that, that uh, some friends of mine in uh, Harvard did last year or a couple of years ago. They had a little girl with a neurodegenerative disease called Batten syndrome, um, which is a terrible neurodegenerative metabolic disease. When they did genetic testing, they only found one mutation. With research testing, they were able to find there was a deep intronic mutation that led to an abnormal splice site being introduced into the introns, and so that, that copy of the gene was not working because of this extra splice site. They developed an antisense oligonucleotide just for her mutation that stopped her disease, slowed, well, at least slowed it down, um, was able to reverse the effects of that splice site, restore normal function in that gene that copy of the gene. And so this was personalized therapy. This was a treatment that's not going to be applicable to anybody else. Um, it's really just for her and her mutation. Um, but it was both effective and inspiring. And so we're trying to figure out now at Mayo, how do we sort of operationalize that? We've got lots of patients with mutations that could be amenable to this kind of treatment, but they're the only ones with that mutation. And so how do we address the regulatory requirements and kind of the uh, how do you do a phase one or phase two or phase three trial in a, in a disease like this where the medication is only applicable to your specific patient? And so I think there's a lot of groups, not just us at Mayo, trying to figure out how to address those kinds of questions. And, but I think there's a future where we've got really, truly personalized therapeutics for patients. The issues around payment is something we're going to have to figure out, and it's, it's going to be challenging. But the chemistry is there. 
now, which is very, very exciting. Let's pivot one more time and talk about gene therapy. So gene therapy, one of the reasons I'm a geneticist is I went to a medical school lecture in the mid 90s saying gene therapy was right around the corner. I'm sort of giving that lecture now. Um, I think it's right around the corner, um, it, but I think it actually is now. Um, the original idea for gene therapy came around, out in the 1970s. And there's been lots of fits and starts and, um, and sort of close to successes, but not quite. I think we're really getting there now. Um, some of the challenges around gene therapy is if you introduce a virus, cells don't like that. And so there's lots of issues with the immune response and um, silencing of introduced genes. Um, cells that are dividing, may the, the introduced um, genes could be diluted out. Would they be copied and brought with the dividing cells? It depends on what vector you're using. There's lots of uh, issues around gene therapy. The first gene therapy trials were mostly in spina, um, bone marrow diseases, uh, especially severe combined immune deficiency. Uh, one of the nice things about um, this kind of disorder is you can take out stem cells, treat them in the lab, put them back in. Um, and this worked in a way. So the initial treated patients, uh, the nine patients, eight of them had a good response in terms of reconstituting their immune system. The challenge was these viral genomes were being integrated not quite at random, but more or less at random into the uh, genome of the host. And in some cells, they were disrupting or interrupting um, you know, oncogenes or tumor suppressor genes or um, uh, things like that. And so about half of the patients ended up developing leukemia. So that wasn't great. Um, and so that led to sort of a pivoting in approach. The first FDA-approved gene therapy was just a couple of years ago, and that was for uh, a disease called Labor's congenital amaurosis, which is a genetic retinal disease that leads to blindness, usually in early adulthood. Some are earlier, some are later. Um, the retina is interesting. It's, it's a very uh, attractive tissue for gene therapy. There's some viruses that are particularly um, sort of friendly to uh, retinal cells. It's accessible and it's also immune protected. So it's kind of like CNS, except you can inject it in the clinic. Um, at least an ophthalmologist can, I can't. Um, and so the first gene therapy was really targeting this RPE65 type of labor's congenital amaurosis. And it worked. Patients that were blind could see again. It was quite amazing. I remember being at a conference where they sort of showed their data for the first time and you saw patients who couldn't see, we're now navigating around a room without a cane and without, you know, it's quite amazing. Um, and so that was the first big success. It was approved late uh, 2017, so about uh, almost uh, four years ago, a little over four years ago. Again, the challenge is cost. It's $425,000 per eye, which is, you know, a lot. Um, but what is the cost of vision? Um, it's something we have to deal with and from a sort of policy standpoint. Another big success of gene therapy recently is again spinal muscular atrophy. Uh, I mentioned that spinal muscular atrophy was a very small gene, eight exons. That makes it very uh, attractive to gene therapy. Some of the viruses we use as vectors are limited in terms of how big of a gene you can stick in there. Um, and so AAV9 or adeno-associated virus type 9 is probably the most studied and most widely used vector right now in gene therapy development. Um, but it's quite limited in terms of how big of a gene you can stick in there. Uh, and so a lot of diseases we would like to treat with gene therapy, we can't use this kind of most developed uh, vector system. One of the nice things about this virus is it does cross the blood-brain barrier. It gets uptake, uh, good uptake into CNS neurons. Um, in the initial treatments for spinal muscular atrophy, first one, 15 patients, all with severe disease, all survived, none required mechanical ventilation, none were tube fed, uh, which is remarkable. You know, it really works. Uh, this is kind of a score of motor function. You can see these kids continue to make progress in their motor skills and then lose them. A typical SMA patient would have some gain and then rapidly lose. 
There's one patient they treated later in the course of their disease, and that really didn't help. So it's, again, important to treat early before spinal uh, motor nerves are lost. So it works really nicely, and, and uh, the newborn screen is, again, super important. This was approved uh, about two years ago, um, $2.1 million per dose, which is something that we, again, have to deal with. We generally can get insurance to cover it, but it's hard. Some states are, um, you know, having lottery systems where they're willing to pay for X number per year and not beyond that because it is such a drain on resources. Because this, again, is a common disease. Gene therapy is coming. There, last time I looked, which was a couple months ago, there's 133 different active gene therapy trials, um, a couple dozen of which are happening here at Mayo. Um, not just here, Mayo, but these are most, usually multi-center uh, studies. Um, and uh, we're going to see a lot more treatments like this come, uh, which is very, very exciting. Um, it's going to really change, I think, how I practice and how a lot of us practice in terms of having now treatments for these really terrible disorders. So to summarize, um, genetic testing is really exciting and interesting. It's also better and more comprehensive. It's cheaper. It's faster. But it's also a lot more complicated than it's ever been before. I think genetic diagnoses are more useful and actionable than before. Um, and there's lots of exciting therapies coming. I think uh, it's just going to be exponential in the growth of these gene-targeted therapies. But we have to think about from a policy and sort of societal standpoint how we're going to deal with the costs, both for the development and, and treatment of these uh, kinds of things. So that's what I have. I hope that wasn't too fast. And uh, I would love to chat about anything. I see we have one question in the chat. OK. Uh, so mom is talking about sort of prenatal testing. So, um, so different, so the, the big change in prenatal testing recently has been with the non-invasive um, tests. There's a number of different products out there uh, that are designed around isolating fetal DNA or placental DNA from maternal DNA. And um, those are typically very, very good at detecting Down syndrome. With decreasing sensitivity as you get into other genetic diagnoses. Those tests were really designed around Down syndrome specifically, trisomy 21. Um, but they are absolutely not a substitute for diagnostic testing um, when it comes to things like trisomy 13, 18, 22 Q deletion, any of the other sort of thousands of different genetic diseases out there. Um, there are a number of labs working on trying to make fetal DNA or, or cell-free DNA uh, in maternal circulation uh, amenable to things like exome sequencing or genome sequencing. Um, that's not ready for prime time yet and it's not good. Um, they will report a microdeletion. They, I don't think they call them accurately enough to depend on it. I think it's quite a good test for Down syndrome. I don't think it's very much beyond a decent screening test for everything else. The nice test for Down syndrome, because it's not invasive compared to, you know, CBS or amniocentesis, um, but beyond Down syndrome, the it, it should really be viewed as a screening test only and not something to count on. I hope that was addressing her specific question. Other things? Well, um, I hope this got people excited some about genetics. If you have questions, shoot them my way. If you have patients that you think uh, would benefit from seeing us, um, we can see patients a lot by telemedicine, at least for now, hopefully forever. Um, but at least through the uh, PHE, we can. 
Um, so please reach out and happy to share any interesting patients you guys have. Oh, well, thank you for presenting today. Sure. Uh, I will stop sharing my screen. Anything else I can do for anybody? Well, I will head off to my PKU clinic then. <laughs> all right. Thanks. Have a great day. Nice to meet you all virtually and hopefully in person someday. Um, have a great week. Thanks. You too. I know. <laughs>